Hello everyone, uh, good evening everyone here and uh, today we are on to an hour with an expert lecture series 5. Today we have Dr. Bharat Rajguru from Department of Biotechnology, MIT Manipal and we also have and we also have uh, Dr. Shivan Ganju, uh, Chairman uh, at Human Pharmaceuticals Private Limited with us uh, as a panel member. We have Dr. Rishikesh Damle, MD and CEO, Atomic Pharmaceuticals Private Limited, Bangalore. And we have Dr. Lata Damle, CSO, Atomic Pharmaceuticals, Bangalore. We have Dr. Anand S. as a panel member uh, from uh, Ayurve Government Ayurveda uh, College, Tri uh, Trivandrum. And we also have Manoj Kalur. Uh, from AMI and AVVS. And today we are going to uh, have a privilege of listening to our expert, Dr. Bharat Rajguru. He has completed his Bachelor of Engineering in Chemical Engineering from National Institute of Technology. And later on, he has continued his MTech studies in Chemical Engineering in Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Further, he has enrolled for a PhD in Chemical Engineering at Vane in State University, USA. Further, Dr. Bharat Rajguru has joined University of Minnesota, USA as postdoctoral fellow. So after completion of his postdoctoral studies, he has joined uh, Department of Bio Biomedical Engineering, Case Western uh, Reserve University, USA as research associate. Dr. Bharat Rajguru uh, is, act, is having active collaborations with IIT Madras and KMC Manipal. And Dr. Bharat Rajguru has a US patent granted for his research on dendrimers for sustained release of compounds. And he also owns a Indian patent on system and methods for synthesizing isoniazid with hydro, uh, hydrophobic moieties and encapsulating biodegradable polymers. Dr. Bharat Rajguru has also published more than 15 research articles in peer-reviewed international journals with high impact factors. To name a few, he has published his research findings in the Journal of Biomaterials with an impact factor of 8.38, Nanomedicine with an impact, uh, impact factor of 6.2, Molecular uh, Pharmaceutics with an impact factor of 4.35. Fortunately, I am also a co-author in this, uh, one of the research articles. And Dr. Bharat Raj is, an, uh, is also an author of book chapter on optimization of glucocorticoid encapsulated PLGA nanoparticles for inflammatory diseases published by Springjo Singapore. Dr. Bharat Raj Guru is a recipient of research grants from VGST, BIRAC, and Manipal McGill Center for Infectious Diseases for his research on nanomedicine. Dr. Bharat Rajguru has shared his uh, ideas in the different uh, 
conferences and uh, symposium as an in uh, invited speaker. Today, it's a great privilege for us to listen to Dr. Bharat Rajguru. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 there is a there is a welcome speech by Anand. So Anand ji, please uh, welcome before our guest starts. Okay, okay. At most of respect to the all dignitaries, uh, a very warm good evening, and uh, Dr. Shiban Raju, the chairman of Atrimed Pharma, Dr. Bharat Rajguru, who is taking the uh, session today. Uh, Dr. Rishikesh Damle, CEO of Atrimat, Dr. Sadat Dinaga, General Secretary of Ayurveda Medical Association of India, Dr. Manoj Kalu, uh, Arya Vaidya Vilasini Vaidishala, Dr. Uday Kumar Sir, Dr. Lada Damle, Dr. Shaiju, all the dignitaries across the uh, globe and eminent personalities, dear doctors and dear experts. Today, in this series uh, of an hour with an expert, we have a great session with the subject application of nano medicine to treat some of the difficult diseases to cure. This is a very promising and uh, very uh, sought after area since in the field of medicine, the nano medicines are very much getting relevance today. And in especially in this scenario of this infectious disease and the disease of devastating disease like cancer, we have greater role in nano medicine. And uh, even from even characterization of single nano material to nano robotics, there is a large area before this technology. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, have a session with this great expert. Uh, and I'm sure that in the coming days, we have much collaborative works to open in multidisciplinary regard. Since in many of the Basmas in Ayurveda, Rasashastra branch in Ayurveda, in some of the Basmas, the metallo mineral compounds, we have identified some nanoparticles, even ranging to two nanometer, even it is much smaller than a cell. So it's very interesting for all of us to hear the invited speaker and I welcome in a name of uh, Ayurveda Medical Association of India, India, Atrimad Pharma and Ayurveda Vilasini Vaidishala and all uh, present here to welcome this eminent speaker uh, to have a great session here and I am sure that it will open up in some uh, discussion and it will lead to multidisciplinary approach uh, and we have to dig out the treasures of uh, our traditional wisdom Ayurveda, the wisdom of this country in uh, connecting with this uh, emerging field of nanotechnology. So I warmly welcome the speaker Dr. Bharat Rajaguru uh, and all the uh, eminent personalities here and uh, those who are watching across the globe to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Shall I take over now? Okay, okay, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Today, whatever my experience uh, with the uh, nano medicine, uh, I'll speak, uh, and then uh, how it will be useful to cure some of the very difficult diseases, uh, which are considered non-curable in some cases. So first, I'll start with uh, uh, I. Why I is so important is. Just see, this is the actually eye, this is the anterior part of the eye, and this is the posterior part of the eye. And the eye, uh, anterior part and posterior part, is separated by something called vitreous chamber. 
it has a uh, 99% of water and then the main goal of this is to keep the posterior part in an aseptic condition and uh, because you know the posterior part of the eye connected to the central nervous system so it is very uh, uh, you know an, an evolution how we evolved uh, it is a since it is a central connected to the central nervous system it is highly protected so the disease is something which occur in the posterior part of the eye very difficult to uh, cure one of the reason is though you know the drug it will not drug will not reach to the posterior part of the eye because you know suppose you put a anything uh, eye drop or something you put it has to diffuse into the anterior chamber and then to the vitreous chamber and then it has to go to the posterior part probably around 2 to 3% uh, of the drug uh, gets in and uh, you know uh, since posterior part is connected the, uh, to the central nervous system, the immune system is highly active in the posterior part of the eye. Something happens, a small cell death will trigger an immune response, high immune response. In the process, neuroinflammation is, you know, one of the things which occurs drastically and that will create a major problem. Okay. So, then how to solve this problem? So the some of the diseases uh, which are all you know age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, and uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy. These are the uh, diseases uh, uh, which is you know uh, happen in the posterior part of the eye. Glaucoma is because of the neuroinflammation, uh, uh, the uh, the swelling of the eye occurs. So that is a glaucoma. And then say, uh, there is very few data is available uh, about India. So uh, I, I could say that when around 200,000 new cases are going to come up in only in USA every year, which is on age-related macular degeneration. So I tried to find out the data in India, which we really do not have the data. So you just see that as the aged population increases, then these diseases, uh, you know, ought to be, ought to go uh, in the society. So that's why uh, we have to give much importance how to uh, cure or, you know, uh, keep it in a uh, low key. Why curing is difficult, I'll, I'll come to that uh, in later. So as I said, uh, this is the uh, photoreceptor cells are the retinal cells, which I have put here. So it translates light image into electrical signals. So that's why it is connected through the optic nerves and this is connected to the central nervous system. So degeneration of these photoreceptor cells uh, that leads to blindness. So that is the retinal cells. So this is uh, some drug if you, and then also it has a retinal blood barrier. So, uh, Obviously, there are uh, barriers which is in a highly protected region. It makes it, these barriers makes it very difficult to other foreign particles to go there. Uh, because, you know, in, in evolution, what we have evolved, it, this is a highly protected region. So one of them is a blood-brain barrier. So whatever, uh, to, uh, it will not go to the uh, brain uh, easily. So there is a barrier. Similarly, similar to blood-brain barrier, there is a retinal blood barrier. So something which is uh, uh, the blood getting into retina, there is a barrier for that and whatever it is in the blood, it will not go to get into the retina. So most of the drugs which are all, you know, xenobiotic are like the, which are the, uh, which are not produced in the body, then in the process, it may, uh, it may not allow it to pass through the retinal blood barrier. So that is again one of the uh, main uh, problem. Then uh, how uh, these diseases are right now are, uh, you know, treated? Uh, I would say up to 90, there was nothing called a curing. People used to put, say, that most of the time it is a steroid has to be put. They used to put on the, uh, as an, uh, you know, anterior part. They put an eye drop and it's supposed to reach in the, 
diffuse here, diffuse here and reach here. Then afterwards they realize, you know, it is very difficult and the therapeutic value will not reach there. Then they modify it and then can we inject something here into vitreous chamber? Uh, and as I said, vitreous chamber is uh, to protect the posterior part, vitreous chamber is present uh, to maintain the aseptic condition and also the, the to maintain the pressure of the eye. And then say when you inject, you cannot inject every day. So you have to inject and then highly specialized uh, surgeon should inject into vitreous chamber. And then, you know, probably one month or two months once, you can inject again a one more dose or as you avoid, say, one year or two years once if you inject, then, you know, it would be a great uh, uh, thing. So that's what people have tried. One of them is, say, uh, the non-biodegradable polymer device, which releases drug up to 30 months, almost a 0.2 micrograms per uh, a day release. Uh, to, uh, 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 you know, keep the glaucoma. It's a flocinolone acetonide. It's a corticosteroid. It releases uh, uh, for around 30 months. That's what the things. But you just see that it is a non-biodegradable implant. So that since the, uh, though it is a biocompatible, the, the, the polymer is a biocompatible, with the matrix it releases slowly, but it will not degrade. So after 30 months, it floats around in the vitreous chamber. Then again, one more dose. Assume like somebody at the 50 or 50, 55 years has to take this and then he lives up to 75 or 80 years. Uh, then so many non-biodegradable uh, uh, devices will float around in the vitreous chamber. That may not be the uh, a proper idea. Then what people have also something called a scleral plug. In the sclera, something they put a plug of a polymer which releases drugs slowly and then you know that that is a it can be taken out the plug can be taken out so this was also uh, people have tried uh, and then you know it it has to get here and then release uh, but though not many are in the market right now uh, uh, but uh, uh, people are working in the uh, phase 2 phase 3 trail and then say, what about the nanoparticles? If you put the nanoparticle here, what happens? So that is a, one of the thing. So if you put the nanoparticle here, the people have shown, or the researchers have shown, it is taken up in the posterior part of the eye, say around 200 to 300 nanometer, and gets into the retina and stays there for four months. So that is a very good uh, thing. So that is the, say, PLA nanoparticle, uh, this is the seminary paper which is published in 2003 or uh, uh, sometime. So uh, 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 then, you know, it, it, it gets in there and releases uh, slowly. Uh, it stays there for a few months. And then say if it is a microparticle or an implant that is there in the market right now, uh, a corticosteroid dexamethasone is put in here and it releases, floats around in the middle and releases drug. The, uh, that is a mic almost like a implant, and it is a biodegradable implant. The uh, the the uh, the biomaterial degrades. It is a biocompatible, and it degrades slowly and metabolizes in the uh, body. So that is a FDA approved. It is there, and uh, though it is not there in India, it is there in 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 US right now. Uh, it releases drug and then from here it, it goes there. So now whatever my research is, something a uh, 5 to 6 nanometer uh, a polymer, if we get in here, does it get into the uh, retinal cells and release drugs slowly? Okay, that is the, and release drugs slowly for say one month. If I inject a, only one injection, can it? Can I do that? So we selected something called a, a dendrimer. So this is a dendrimer. Dendrimer is a, a you know a tree-like structure. Uh, you make a polymer uh, through polymer. You make a dendritic structure. Uh, dendra, dendron in Greece means it's a uh, it's a tree, and then you can you can make whatever size you want. 
and then you can create the outer surface with the whatever uh, 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 group or like a uh, group which is which is a OH NH2 or COOH group. These are the groups usually which are used for conjugation. So uh, whatever groups can we uh, make? So this can vary, and the molecular weight can be varied, and the size can also be varied. So what we selected is we made a uh, polymer which is a polyamidoamine polymer. So polyamidoamine is ethylene diamine is the uh, major polymer with a dendritic structure which we it it makes. Say as I mentioned here, say that uh, red is 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 a generation of zero generation. So initially you make a polymer uh, zero generation, and then you add again say green uh, generation one, and then say again you polymer as the branches increases generation increases. So one of the important thing is as the generation increases, obviously the molecular weight of the polymer also going to increase. So we stopped it around the generation four, the generation four with the OH group. Say NH2 group is positively charged. Uh, since the cell uh, membrane is negatively charged, then there is a chances that the more and more polymer will uh, get into the uh, cell. Uh, then you know uh, if the more than certain amount of polymer gets into the uh, uh, cell, then it creates a toxicity. So that's why the with the NH2 group, uh, people have shown uh, some amount of polymer, more than some amount of polymer you put, the toxicity is going to increase. And then if it is a COOH, uh, then getting into the then it becomes a you know negatively charged. Getting into the cell itself is a you know. Uh, a problem. So that's why what we selected is a, a neutral charged OH group uh, polymer with the fourth generation. When you keep the fourth generation, what happens is say the molecular weight is around 16,000, around 15,500 molecular weight. And uh, we do not want the molecular weight uh, more than 30, 35,000 because you know if this does not degrade in the body. Uh, uh, there is a, a thumb rule. Uh, the kidney can process up to 30, 35,000 molecular weight of the biocompatible uh, uh, polymers or the proteins, which is uh, uh, less than 30, 35,000 molecular weight. So uh, that's why we selected around 15,000 molecular weight of a uh, polymer. And then we uh, try to use this as a you know drug delivery vehicle. So then first thing what we did was uh, we conjugated this with a fluorescent molecule. A fluorescent molecule is fluoroisothiocyanate. FITC, it's a very well-known fluorescent molecule with a simple chemistry which we have conjugated uh, with the OH group of the uh, uh, dendrimer. And then uh, we checked into, we selected the animals with our healthy rats. The healthy rats means, say, what we want to study is uh, the posterior part of the eye. So the healthy rats says the rats which is having the good photoreceptor cells. And the disease rats, disease rats are Royal College of Surgeon rats. That is the, uh, uh, you know, genetically modified rat uh, with, with, the, with their birth, it's a, it has a degenerating photoreceptor cells. Okay. And after 90 days of its uh, birth, they become completely blind. They will be suffering from retinitis pigmentosa. What that is, they say, this is exactly the retina. This is four, uh, you know, these are the uh, rod cells and cone cells, photoreceptor cells, uh, which is held by uh, pigment epithelial cells. So, uh, at this pigment epithelial degeneration of this pigment epithelial cells will not be able to hold this uh, rod cells and cone cells because of this you know these cells will also start dying this is this this is, is called retinitis pigmentosa so these the, the rats with uh, rcs rats will have a genetically modified rat which have a retinitis pigmentosa from their birth 
And then, uh, you know, what we injected was a three microgram equivalent of FITSI. Because, you know, in the rats, the vitreous chamber uh, is around 60 to 70 microliter. Uh, you just cannot change the inject however, how much ever uh, we want. The maximum change which we can do is around 5 to 10 percent maximum change of the otherwise you know the vitreous chamber will get disturbed so that's why we decided around three micro liter of uh, uh, you know of extra uh, thing uh, we are going to inject so the three microgram in three micro liter which we injected with a pure fit C and uh, another with the conjugated with dendrive dendrimer fit C that is equivalent of pure fit C how much it is Three microgram equivalent of dendrimer FITC and three microgram of pure FITC we injected into the vitreous chamber. So when we did this, so this is the the we took the cryo section of the uh, retina uh, after euthanizing the animal. We took the cryo section of retina. Just look at this. This is the retina. This is exactly the exact uh, the cryo section uh, of the eye. You can look at here at dendrimer fit C after 24 hours. You can see that it's a uh, the uh, the dendrimer fit C is all around. So this star this indicates exactly where the retina is. Okay, retina cells. Just see this the free fit C in 24 hours. It's almost nothing is there. It is washed out. So whatever we are getting, it's a autofluorescence of the tissue. Basic, basically, very small amount must be here. And then it's, it's totally washed out. And then you just look at here, after 24 hours, with a dendrimer fits in a diseased rat, you can see the, the, the dendrimer fits are coming and accumulating in the place exactly where the disease is. That is the retina. Okay, and you see that after 10 days, this dendrimer fit C is present there. Okay, so the free fit C in a diseased rat, you can see after one day, it's, it's in assorted form, it's in everywhere. And in 10 days, the free fit C is nothing is there. Whatever you get, it, this is out of fluorescent from the tissue. So what this really indicates is dendrimer appears to selectively accumulate on the place where the degeneration of retinal cells are taking place. This is exact place where we want to deliver drug. So why it is happening? So this is the one of the theory which we have, uh, which we are trying to understand. So what we understood uh, from this is, as uh, the degeneration starts, the retinal cell starts degenerating, the debris of the cell will trigger immune response. This activate the central nervous system immune response, the macrophages of central nervous system. Usually the three important macrophages of central nervous systems are microglial cells, astrocytes, and Mueller cells. What happens when the disease starts? That means when the cell starts dying, the debris will create the activation of macrophages. Then the macrophages come near to the a place where the disease is and starts releasing cytokines. And this release of cytokines, actually what happens is, this creates uh, the nearing cells, it is going to affect them and the degeneration of retinal cells will, you know, uh, happen quickly. So then this creates a inflammation because of the release of these cytokines. Then the First thing we, what we will have to do is inhibits the activation of these macrophages. That means the release of cytokines. That itself will help the inflammation to reduce drastically. This will create a good uh, thing. Though the degeneration, we cannot stop the degeneration because of the whatever the, uh, you know, a genetic, if it is genetic. But further... Uh, uh, you know, aggravation of the disease because of the inflammation can be stopped. So that's why most of the time what they give is a steroid to inhibit the activation of this 
macrophages. That's what exactly uh, 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 the uh, the drug is. And then you know to check this whether these cells are getting ac activated or the activated macrophages are present near the where the disease is. That's what which we, we checked. So GFAP immunostaining of activated retinal cells. See, this the GFAP. We put the GFAP there. You know, it is binding. That means it it only goes and binds where the activated microglial cells are present. Exactly, that is there. So when you look at that, this is the uh, the the GFAP staining in a in a red, and then say in the green is the whatever the dendrimer is. So exactly, that is there in the in the area. The same thing like uh, immuno uh, uh, methodology was done for the. Uh, Oh, oh, the activated microglial cells and the astrocytes. This this shows that the dendrimers are localizing uh, in where the neuro, neuro inflammation is there, and the neuro inflammation is because of the activation of microglial cells and the astrocytes and the Mueller cells. What we checked is the, for the astrocytes and the uh, and the microglial cells, which which are activated or not, which the which this immunostaining which we have found out. They are activated uh, microglial cells and the activated astrocytes are present in the in the place. So next thing, what do you expect? So shall we put a, a steroid, a drug, conjugating on the surface of the nano uh, of the uh, dendrimer, which is the size of around six nanometer, and then see whether it gives the same therapeutic effect? If that is the case, then you know. Uh, it should go and stay there and release drugs slowly. The, the drug, actually what it does is it inhibits the activation of these macrophages. Then the inflammation reduces drastically. Uh, that will, uh, you know, uh, stop uh, further degeneration, the aggravation of the disease. So that's what we did by using the chemistry, the use the spacer and... And then, you know, uh, this is a, a pure chemistry which we uh, uh, worked on. And then drug was conjugated. We conjugated uh, using the ester bond because, you know, ester bonds are, what we want is it goes there and it has to degrade. The bond should degrade. So we made a covalent bond with the ester bond. Ester bonds are known as hydrolytically cleavable. So that though it will not be cleaved, uh, at a time and then you know it cleaves uh, slowly so that's what which we did we made a ester bond which are hydrolytically cleavable and then uh, we characterized it the characterization we put around see the dendrimer he is a water soluble this is a water soluble because you know there are a lot of OH groups are there steroids as we know it's a highly hydrophobic molecule and we have optimized it around 5.5 molecules approximately at average of 5.5 to 6 uh, steroids if it is conjugated on the surface of the dendrimer then it becomes it keeps the solubility if it is more than that then you know it precipitates so what we want is it has to when you inject into the vitreous chamber it should be solubilized in the uh, vitreous chamber in the uh, in the solution and then it should float and go to the posterior part of the eye. So that's why we conjugated around 5.5 molecules average uh, dendrimer uh, on the surface of the, uh, sorry, uh, corticosteroids on the surface of the dendrimer uh, to keep the solubility. And then, you know, characterize with the uh, H uh, NMR and then it is Further checked with the Malditoff to check the molecular weight, whether it, it is matching. And then we also released this uh, in a, a, a say 7.4 pH. That is the vitreous chamber. The pH is 7.4. So if it gets in, uh, uh, to put in the vitreous chamber, say, uh, how it releases. Say, when you look at it at 7.4 pH, the dendrimer releases up to three months. It's, it's you know, it's a very good... Uh, and then say to compare that we have say PEG polyethylene glycol uh, uh, which is a, a polymer which is a, a linear polymer we conjugated the same uh, same way and checked it 
it it it is around you know 30 uh, of uh, rather around uh, 50 days around 90% is released and here it is in the 3 months it's only 60 65% is released so that means uh, this is dendrimers are releases much slower than how the linear polymer is. There is one more theory based uh, on that because the dendrimers are a dendritic structure. The some of the enzymes are required to you know uh, cleave or you know in the process what happens uh, because of its structure uh, the release is very slow. That is one more uh, uh, analogy which we have understood. Then afterwards, what we did was we took a RCS rats and uh, uh, for the experiment and then you know we have to check how the retinal cells are active or not that's what the main goal is so the important way with the evaluation is electroretinography electroretinography that is erg it shows how active the uh, uh, retinal cells are the electrical signals processed by retinal cells if the signals are more processed in the retinal cells, that means more cells are active. That's why it gives a ret uh, electroretinography data. The other one is you take then, then and then, you know, check the uh, how much cells are active, the cell count by uh, in outer nuclear layer of retina, that is where exactly uh, the disease is. And we injected, right eye was injected, that is, ocular dextrous and left eye is kept as a control okay the experiment was conducted between fifth week to ninth week of their birth so you know as i said that in three months this becomes blind so it's almost like a one month of their birth to you know uh second month of their birth so where the disease is in a, in a prime state so that that's what all the uh, rats were used. So with the birth and then take them in a, in the same time, the fifth week to ninth week. So we look at here the fifth week to ninth week. Uh, so electroretinography data. So ERG amplitude is more means the more cells are active here. You just see that as we expect it decreases slowly, fifth week to ninth week. So uh, you know, this untreated, the another was a PBS as a control. Just look at that, it decreases slowly. Okay, so then the same three microgram equivalent of drugs used. You can look at that, uh, the dendrimer when we injected electroretinography data, it is a much better one. So in the process, what it shows is, it says, hey, ERG is when you look at that, so one month, one injection of three microgram equivalent of drug, it can keep it around, you know, one one month. Oh, this is a very good, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, data. And then say, when you count the cells, you can look at that, not even three microgram. So three microgram we injected and see, if the one microgram equivalent is a sufficient for one month, the number of cells which are active is much higher than whatever the implant which is present, which releases 0.2 microgram per day, which is present in the uh, you know market. So the if you compare that around six times lower dosage uh, is sufficient to keep the cells which is more active than what is present in the market. So what this really shows is sustained intracellular release from the dendrimer uh, is possible. Okay. So now I will, you know, this is the uh, whatever uh, uh, of which I explained. This is the conclusion of that one injection of three micro or liter of injection uh, with a one microgram equivalent of drug and three microgram equivalent of drug which is uh, sufficient to keep the ERG data almost stable. That means to keep the retinal cells active. And then, you know, uh, the same, uh, uh, the, if you use the same uh, drug with that, the number of cells which are active is much better than the whatever present in the market. So now, uh, uh, see, this is why it happens. So the probably 
the dendrimers are taken up by the cells with a different mechanism uh, compared to the free drug with a different uh, mechanism rather it is a endocytosis so endocytosis is the one when it is this the macrophages are very well known whenever the nanoparticles were near to that it starts engulfing it and it starts uh, engulfing and then once it engulfs then the drug will uh, nanoparticle will be there inside the uh, macrophages and it releases drug once it releases drug that inhibits the activation of the microglial cells which which activation will release the cytokines and this will reduce the uh, uh, inflammation the same thing what happens in cerebral palsy cerebral palsy is the one of the things which is a which is a major problem there is almost a no cure with the birth somebody we gets cerebral palsy and then you know first thing what they will have to do is that the uh, reduce the neuro information so when did the birth after one day if you inject a, a a particular place of the brain with this polymer it goes and inhibits the whatever the inflammation is that that means the macrophages it goes and gets into the macrophage and releases slowly so this is again done with the uh, cerebral palsy so this will be useful in that also so how the nanoparticles which are very useful uh, because you know steroids right now people are taking through mouth some some cases you just imagine from the from the eye drop a 2 to 3% gets in if people taken uh, through mouth and it's supposed to reach the place probably 0.2 0.3% it will reach and the steroids has got you know tremendous side effects so that's why people for say age related macular degeneration they do not take any medicine because you know you cannot administer steroid for such a long time the side effects are so high you assume say some cases like age related macular de degeneration or retinal dispigmentosa which the retinal cell starts dying somebody at the age of 60 he gets say because a age related macular degeneration let us assume age related macular degeneration uh, if the macula is the concentrated cell of retinal cells the macula is degenerating assume and because of once the degeneration starts then inflammation occur because of that inflammation the degeneration gets aggravated if we uh, if we stop inflammation then you know the degeneration will be very slow say somebody is going to become blind at say 65 if he becomes blind at 75 or 80 then you are giving a, a 10 years of a good life for a person now they are not doing it because the you cannot give a steroid uh, through mouth or through the eye drop it, it it hardly reaches there so if you inject say every 6 months once something like that and then you know exactly it goes there and stays there and releases uh, this will be a very useful uh, uh, you know uh, drug delivery vehicle so nano medicine will be very useful here now i shift uh, to something a uh, cancer how can nano medicine uh, nano particles are through nano uh, how the cancer will be uh, uh, you know treating cancer will become easy so the cancer is as you know it is a uh, uncontrolled growth uh, uh, of the cells uh, rather because you know cancer is something which is happens some control which supposed to follow by our own cells which is not following it that is the cancer so that is that the, we do not have control over our own body that is exactly what is the cancer is okay so the so uncontrolled growth of the cells because of lot of uh, you know things and then if you if you put a nanoparticles the drug cancer cells the cancer drugs are what basically the drugs are which are going and kill the cells which are multiplying okay 
So the, there is nothing called the drug will go exactly the cancer cells and then you know it kills the cell. Whichever cells which are multiplying, it goes and binds there and stops multiplication. So that's why in the process, uh, you know, the side effects of the cancer drugs is tremendous. How to reduce these side effects? This is a nanomedicine will be useful. That is exactly what we are looking into. So cancer, as I said, it makes the cells which are uncontrolled growth are, I would put it in a very simple way, what the cancer is, is it is just like in our society, what, uh, you know, uh, who does the, 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 the people who, who are anti-social elements, who do not follow the rules. Okay. The cancer cells are like that inside our body. So they are supposed to follow certain rules and they are rebellious. They are not following those rules. So that uh, what is that rules? It, they are to get into apoptosis and then, you know, the, the programmed way of cell death should happen. But in, they do not die. And then it is just like, you know, they start growing. And, you know, cancer cells are jack of all and master of none. So once they start growing, obviously they require nutrition. When they require nutrition, what they have to make their uh, nutrition through, they have to create their own blood vessel from the regular blood. It is just like, it is just cancer is, I could connect with like a slum and somebody in a slum, they want a current, what do they, what do, they do? Whatever the line, current line is there, they connect it to them. But, you know, it may not be a very uh, proper way, but, you know, uh, they connected it. In the process, you know, they, it may be very dangerous also, same way. And the water pipe, and then somebody is connects the water pipe, which is the regular pipe. Same thing happens inside our body. So the, since they are jatafal, they have to survive, then they make their own blood vessels from the, their, their, from the actual blood vessel. They create their own blood vessel to get the nutrition. While making that, the blood vessels are leaky. So they cannot make a good blood vessel because, you know, it's not there. This is their jack of all. It's a survival instinct, but master of none. And then in the process, what happens? If it is a nanoparticle passes through where the tumor is, because this is the tumor, when the tube passes through the blood vessel, it is a leaky the nanoparticles will get into the tumor very easily. And they do not, and then, then afterwards, you know, there is something called a, in our body, blood is the nutrition it follows, and then the, some another one is a lymphatic drainage system. And it's a poorly connected lymphatic drainage system. So once the nanoparticle gets in there, there is no lymphatic drainage system exactly present properly. In the process, what happens? The nanoparticle stays in the tumor for a long time. And one more thing about this uh, cancer cells are, as I said, they are jack of all. They overexpress certain receptors, like certain integrins are overexpressed, like vascular endothelial growth factor, because you know they have to vasculation, they have to make vascularization between the other thing. They overexpress certain vascular endothelial growth factor receptors, which are overexpresses that. And then epidermal growth factor receptors, they overexpress that. In the process, because of this overexpression, you can create a ligand on the surface of the nanoparticle. So suppose a, a receptor, for that receptor, you create a ligand, the nanoparticle encapsulated with a drug, it goes and binds to that receptor and taken up with the mechanisms called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So this is uh, actually happens in the in in the in some of the cells. So then when it taken up takes up in that way, then you know it releases drug. Then this becomes you are targeting a cancer cells. Not exactly you know uh, without the targeting moiety is a passive targeting. And with targeting moiety, it is a targeting to the cancer cells. That means since it is not only cancer cells expresses, the cancer cells over expresses. So 
because it over expresses the chances of getting nanoparticle with a ligand and that is much more than the uh, getting into other cells. So this is called enhanced permeation and retention. It is called EPR effect. It enhanced permeation will be enhanced and because there is no lymphatic drainage system, it retention takes place. Because of this, you know, then, you know, if we do this uh, with the nanoparticle and then, you know, we created a, uh, uh, on the surface, as RGD peptide sequence, which is a, a ligand for alpha V beta 3 integrins, which is overexpressed by some of the breast cancer cell lines. Okay. So if you put this and then we checked into the thing, you just look at it is here, how much a cell it will take up. You can see this, the nanoparticle taken up with the uh, CRGD peptide is much higher than say you put a CRGD as a excess outside and then you just look at that here it is much less. Instead of CRGD we modified whether because the ligand is a perfect it should be CRAD that is C is a cyclic RAD is the peptide uh, amino acid three amino acids which we have put if you put this CRAD, you just look at here, the amount of taken up with the receptor-mediated endocytosis is much more than the CRAD. So this, again, we can see the same uh, results in the tumor cells. So the tumor, uh, if we look at how much it is, the, the same results which we have got in the uh, tumor. So the uh, uh, with the uh, ligand on the surface, more nanoparticle gets into the uh, uh, tumor cells. The same thing which we did with the epidermal growth factor receptors. It is overexpressed by epithelial cells, cancer epithelial cells. And then when we, epi uh, this is a, a particular ligand which goes and binds to the res that receptor. So using a chemistry which we created, and look at here, the same results which we get that this uh, PANC C cells uh, and then A549 and U87, all of them are uh, uh, which overexpress uh, EGFR. And then you just look at that, uh, the, the amount of uh, intake into the cell with the ligand on the surface is much, much higher than without ligand on the surface. So then how the killing is, whether with the killing is, is in the same way, just look at this. It is at the 10 uh, nanomolar equivalent. Just look at that, the cell viability, it is almost, you know, 30% much higher than the, uh, uh, you know, cell uh, death compared to the uh, nanoparticle. And then, you know, compared to the free drug, it is much, much higher. So we uh, did this with the we uh, A549 a tumor we grown into the uh, uh, you know mice nude mice. Look at here it is uh, with the nanoparticle uh, and then EGFR. Uh, the tumor growth is uh, it slowly grows compared to the control and the drug. Okay, so. Uh, the drug will be more effective if it is into the nanoparticle and it is, if it is put on the surf, uh, a ligand on the surface of the nanoparticle. That's exactly which we have found out. So the cancer, the main problem with the cancer is, you know, uh, most of you know about it when metastasis occur in the cancer. We are, what is this metastasis? Metastasis is, you know, when the tumor cells, I will put it in a very simple term, when tumors grows beyond that, among the tumor cells, some of the cells are very smart and they understand why I have to struggle with these cells. Let me move out of from among uh, these cells and go out and somewhere, let me reestablish somewhere else. So, dot cells are a very 
you know uh smart cells and they have stem cell like property they are called cancer stem cells they move out and reestablish move out and the establish in a some other place that is called metastasis when metastasis occur then you know that is a problem the curing the cancer is cancer is very difficult then which is these smart cells we will have to kill these smart cells okay so the the the, the smart cells are called cancer stem cells which has a stem cell like property say suppose if you have you kill all the cells it reduces if it is a only one cell which survives then you know the tumor will grow again this is exactly what happens so now like how to target the cancer stem cells are by by making the nanoparticle whether it will be useful so what we have understood is with the epidermal growth factor receptor uh ligand on the surface when we did that and check the amount of cancer stem cells just look at here the amount of cells which are which has got a stem cells you you put a some amount of drug what exactly it means is here the amount of cells when you put the drug the cells which are cancer stem cells like property the percentage is going to increase because they have the ability to survive okay so we use the 5 nanomolar amount of paclitaxel you just look at that in the nanoparticle it's around at 25% say control cells usually it's around 4% of the or the smart cells if you after the treatment when you look at this just see the cancer stem cells population should increase as as it is say that has increased because you know those are, those cells are surviving but if you look at here when you put a uh, targeted moiety on the surface then the amount of cancer stem cells are also reduced drastically significantly this shows through the receptor mediated endocytosis when something a cell takes up there's a chance that you know it avoids the cancer stem cells for, uh, for the survival okay so what is this cancer stem cells they have something called a pgp like proteins which has efflex the drug outside when 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 the drug gets in so probably when it gets through the receptor mediated endocytosis it avoids that efflexing pump and then you know in the process it will be able to kill the uh, cancer stem uh, cells so further uh, you know work is required in this area and now the many people have, uh, have worked on this uh, the antibodies are produced especially for uh, some of the blood cancers uh, uh, the the cure is there actually the antibodies are produced which goes and binds exactly the cancer cells uh, with uh, because of the certain receptors it goes and binds exactly to the cancer cells and then you know neutralizes the cell and uh, uh it is there in the market right now uh that this is what exactly the with the nanoparticle uh compared to the free drug you know nano medicine will be very useful to cure uh, cancer so the now the last part which i go into tuberculosis you know the tuberculosis is a very uh a deadly disease It's six thousand years old disease, and then you know, more than hundred years back, uh, uh, Robert Koch, which he has identified it, and first vaccine, BCG vaccine, came in nineteen twenty. Okay, uh, uh, but still, there it is only for the uh, juvenile uh, people up to less than five years. Uh, it, it it helps. Still, there is no vaccine for tuberculosis. and then you know uh, southeast asia is a you know breeding ground of this tuberculosis uh, 30% of the world's uh, uh, tuberculosis patients are in india and then you know as all of you know our prime minister has said uh, 
you know, by 2025, we should eradicate the tuberculosis. I don't know on what basis he said this, but WHO has, uh, uh, you know, kept by 2040 or 2050, we should eradicate tuberculosis like smallpox and other diseases from this uh, world. That's what the WHO's uh, uh, idea. Is it possible? That's what the present treatment, whatever it is, is it possible to eradicate? That is the questions which we are going to ask. So uh, the problem is that tuberculosis is, this is the data exactly uh, how many people are in India and what are the number of people in the uh, in the globe. So the, in India, around 32% of TB deaths uh, happens in, uh, in India and 27% of all TB cases the world is in India and 24% of multi-drug uh, multi resistance drug resistance uh, TB is present in India. So why this is uh, a very important? We will have to understand the pathogenesis of this, uh, uh, this uh, disease. Uh, just look at this. This is a, uh, it's a through aerosol. The tuberculosis is a very small organism. It spreads through aerosol. Say somebody gets into a, a hospital and then you inhale with the patient's uh, uh, mouth and then you know that's it uh, you are infected infection is not a disease that is a, one of the things what you will have to understand in tuberculosis why it is so just look at here when you inhale something it gets into the cell that is uh, uh, the uh, the lung alveoli cells which gets in once the problem with that is the macrophages, alveolar macrophages, identifies the tuberculosis quickly and it engulfs. Or it, uh, or it, in a simple word, it swallows. That's what the macrophages do when it sees the any uh, pathogen. When it swallows, it will not be able to kill that because you know how it happens is macrophages it forms a endosomes from endosomes it gets into lysosomes and lysosomes it lyses each of those and then it gets into cytoplasm and then you know the the proteins will be processed or you know macrophages take the particular protein and it goes to lymph no uh, lymph uh, node and then you know if the macro and then gets into to give it to b cells and t cells to produce a uh, identifies to produce the antibodies for that particular antigen. This is how exactly in, in the case it happens. In this case, what happens when it gets into endosomes, it will not able to kill and lysosomes, it will not able to kill because mycobacteria tuberculosis, the cell wall is made up of mycolic acid. It is resistant to the whatever the, uh, the killing which uh, happens with other organisms. Then what happens, this macrophages gets, uh, you know, starts, uh, it is just like a, it starts giving a signal to the other cells, other immune cells. Then those immune cells, what they do is, it starts, comes and makes a small ball-like structure that is called granuloma. So what it has is the macrophages inside, and it forms a ball like the other cells is around and then say then it forms like this structure and then this is you know 50% uh, of Indians that's what uh, Wikipedia uh, says but uh, uh, you know the physician says around 70 to 80 percent of Indians will have this uh, they're infected but infection doesn't mean that you know uh, it's a, a disease what happens is when it is in the when it forms like this small ball, that is a, a latent tuberculosis. It survives inside, but it will not multiply. It survives there. When the immune system is in compromised condition of our body, then what happens? This latent uh, tuberculosis it slowly starts multiplies and gets out of the uh, 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 the the ball like structure of granuloma and spread to the other part, or it multiplies in the in the other part of the lungs. 
now you want to kill or you want to put a drug for this the prophylactic effect that's what people have tried you want to give when this is there say when it is a infection you give the drug to here the amount of drug reaches here is so less the side effects of the drug is so high because you have to give antibiotics and then you know uh, the prophylactic effect will not work and once it forms this then you start giving the drug and then you know tuberculosis mycobacterium tuberculosis is a very uh, a smart uh, microorganisms so since it is very smart microorganism we have to give four types of drug to confuse it okay so how the drug treatment is the two months you give a four drugs which the how the drugs work there are say rifampicin isoniazid two important very important drugs uh that is one that is isoniazid acts on the cell wall and then you know uh, this cell wall degradation starts uh, because of that you know uh, starts dying rifampicin it goes and binds to rna polymerase of the uh of uh, the uh, then it will not produce able to produce uh, uh, rna synthesis will not happen that's why it is going to die and say uh, same thing with the uh, pyrozinamide uh, and ethan ethan butyl so initially you give two months of these four drug finally you give four months of rifampicin and isoniazid so six months you have to uh take drug it's a very long uh, process so in the process what happens most of the people are uneducated people after taking two months of the drug they may stop taking it because you know they may feel start feeling better and stop taking the drug and then survived uh, one will get a resistance of that because of that they you know multi drug resistance tb is very common in india and now extremely drug resistant tb is also coming up that is also common in india so now how to solve this problem okay so the granuloma when formation takes place there are four stages one of the important granuloma stage is necrotic granuloma in this what happens is though the granuloma is intact it starts slowly some activation of the latent tb will starts taking place if you identify during this time and put the drug here and drug should get in inside the macrophage and then stay there and release drug for long time and then kill instead of you know the bus burst open and then it goes to some other place if that if we can target here and cure the disease then you know it will be a, a, a great help so the initial work what we did that's what which we are going to explain so this is exactly what it is say the macrophages takes it and then suppose we put the drug with loaded nanoparticle with the here and it the, the nanoparticle stays inside the macrophage and releases and when it releases the chances of killing uh, for a, if it releases for long time and killing is very high and for this the, we use the two types of uh, drug rifampicin and isoniazid uh that those are the uh, drugs which are used on 19 it kills the 99% of the tb and then you know very potent drug and the problem with these two drugs is you test to when you you are you are taking as as i said the last four months you are taking these two drugs simultaneously there is a chance that there is a reaction between these two drugs and some of the drugs will not be used at all okay and the other part is what we have identified is isoniazid is a is got a nh2 group here and then you know it's because of this it's a highly water soluble drug and the drug penetration into the cell is because you know uh, tuberculosis survives inside the cell drug penetration itself is a problem that's why you know the more drug is required so what we have thought was 
can we make it a more little more hydrophobic and make it more stable and gets into the uh, uh, cell uh, easily so we modified this with benzaldehyde benzaldehyde is a common food supplement which is used and then which we made this with the benzaldehyde a small modification and used and checked whether it has the same potent as isoniazid and rifampicin is as i said it is tested as a rifampicin as i exactly said each of this drug these drug independently they can kill okay and also check the uh, how the rifampicin stability is you know rifampicin highly instable at uh, acidic ph you can look at that in acidic ph one is at the room temperature other one is at the uh, body temperature at 37 degrees centigrade the body temperature you just look at that it degrades same thing at 4.5 ph it degrades and then at 2.5 ph it degrades so quickly okay so that's why you know after the food you will have to take uh, because you know if you take the food when our stomach is 2.5 ph it before the food it's almost uh, hardly you find the drug uh, uh, reaches the actual uh, place so uh, this is what the stability of the drug which we have identified at a different uh, ph condition and then we released in the nanoparticle whether in the if you put it in a nanoparticle it is going to increase the stability of the drug that's exactly what we found out you look at that the drug will be released for 30 days except the 2.5 ph 2.5 ph the nanoparticle cannot hold exactly because the what we use is a polylactic lactide co-glycolide polymer at 2.5 ph at the it, it is made up of a ester bond it breaks open so that's why you look at here that you know it's it breaks open and then at 2.5 ph almost uh, you know it, it's not a release but in other cases you can look at that up to 30 days the drug is available so we measured uh, the measuring of the drug is the intact drug how much it is so that means that by encapsulating into the nanoparticle the stability of the drug is going to increase drastically then we checked with the same way how the saliva or any uh, patients uh, 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 patients, uh, 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 you know, an infected patient is uh, checked. The MGIT uh, Back Tech 960 instrument, this is the WHO approved instrument. All the, uh, you know, this is the gold standard in the case right now. What we use is we use a 37 RV strain, that is a, one of the tuberculosis strain which uh, is uh, incubated and kept in a, exactly in this instrument and then we added the our uh, uh, whatever formulation in nanoparticle and comparing that with the control okay so you just look at here a one microgram equivalent of a rifampicin actually the growth unit is zero means it inhibits the uh, complete growth of tuberculosis. That means one microgram per ml equivalent of drug reaches the particular place that will kill all the tuberculosis. Okay, that is called a MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration for its growth. Then afterwards we checked whether it only inhibits or it kills. It actually kills. And then we just look at that when we reduce that to in a nanoparticle around 0.7 microgram equivalent of that. Okay, so 0.7 microgram equivalent of nanoparticle uh, uh, in the form of new formulation, it inhibits. So almost a 30% of drug is reduced uh, by just encapsulating into the nanoparticle. Say 0.7 microgram equivalent of say, rifampicin, you can just that it will not. So the growth unit 400 in the sense that exactly at the, the growth of tuberculosis. So 30% of the drug can be reduced uh, just by encapsulating into the uh, uh, 
uh, nanoparticle. So once we modify with the uh, isoniazid, now when we look at the isoniazid, we modified the isoniazid with uh, benzaldehyde. We call this as IH2. So we are the first people who, who showed this uh, uh, new uh, pro-drug. Actually, you can call it as a pro-drug. Just look at this. When we make that, the IH2 stability is going to increase drastically. At say 7.4 pH, just look at this uh, isoniazid degradation occur. And in the, this is the IH2 degradation. Though the stability of IH2 increases drastically, and the IH2 release is also, you can look at it at the, at the different pHs at 7.4. Uh, uh, 4 and 4.5 pH. Uh, uh, as I said, this 2.5 pH is very difficult to make a control release. And then see, you just look at it, the 7.4 and the 4.5 pH, you can release uh, slowly uh, the IS2. And one of the other thing what which we have identified is encapsulating into the nanoparticle increases drastically, around 15 to 20 times increase. If it is a isoniazid, it is a highly water soluble drug. If we only want to encapsulate into the nanoparticle like a hydrophobic polymer, most of the polymers are hydrophobic, and then we want to encapsulate, then only 10 microgram is possible. If you modify it, it's around nearly around 175 microgram per milligram uh, can be encapsulated. So it's around this 15 to 20 times much more than the actual encapsulation. And in the process, the amount of drug availability is also going to increase. Then we checked how exactly this is going to, uh, this one, oh, sorry, I think I have missed one. Yeah. Okay, then when we check that with the IH2, uh, we get the same uh, uh, effect as uh, isoniazid. So I, when you modify the drug, the equivalent of a uh, yeah, minimum inhibitory uh, concentration of isoniazid is actually 0.1 microgram per ml. Now, when you modify that, molar equivalent, it will become 0.16 microgram. If you put a 0.16 microgram of, a, uh, of that uh, in, into this, it inhibits the total uh, uh, multiplication of tuberculosis uh, pathogen. So it acts exactly like a drug with the modification, though we were not able to decrease the concentration. So it exactly it acts like a drug. If you reduce the concentration, uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration is not going to decrease for the, for the whatever IH2. Now what we did was, uh, you know, the macrophages are as we said, these macrophages, when we get into the cell and then, you know, it, uh, it should release the drug. We did a simple ex experiment. What we identified, all the macrophages, most of the macrophages overexpress folate receptor. So for that, the ligand is folic acid. So we put the folic acid on the surface of the nanoparticle and checked on the, one of the macrophages a RA264.7, that is the cell line, a macrophage cell line which is available. You look at here, the folic acid, folate receptor, uh, folic acid conjugated one, a compared to the uh, PLGA, only pure drug, you know, you know, the big difference. Okay. When you put a PEG on the surface, it increases a little bit. Uh, there is a one more theory because PEG avoids the macrophages to opsonize. So what we put is a, on the PEG, we put the folic acid on the surface. You just look at the, this is the nanoparticle and then, you know, increase. Whether the folate, uh, folate receptor is acting, what we did was we checked with by adding some amount of folic acid, in pure folic acid to block the sum of the receptor. You can look at here to block the sum of the receptor exactly which has blocked. And this is the, with the some amount of folic acid, free folic acid, 
when we put you know the uptake of the a nanoparticle in the cell decreases drastically okay so now the next thing is we can also make a folate uh, folic acid on the surface we can target the macrophages so that in a tuberculosis uh, with the folic acid on the surface it exactly goes and binds to the macrophage and then you know gets into the cell and then the killing will become very easy the problem is because the tuberculosis is a uh, you know highly infectious disease we were not able to make an animal model and progress in this in this uh, project uh, it requires a biosafety level a higher level so similar type what we did say chlamydial infection is a deadly infection uh, uh, which survives the chlamydia survives in intra intracellular just look at that if a nanoparticle will uh, because it survives say this is a chlamydia which survives if you put a nanoparticle you just go see that nanoparticle gets into the chlamydia the chances of killing is extremely high so for infectious diseases many of the infectious diseases like this the nanoparticle will become it's it's only it also because nanoparticle will also gives the stability for the drug because you know at a time the nano uh, the drug will not be exposed and then slowly when it releases you know the killing the amount of therapeutic amount is going to decrease drastically this will help uh, in killing the uh, infection and also uh, reducing the drug resistant uh, you know pathogens so i stop here the first work which i did it in wayne state university uh, the right now the uh, dr r m kannan is in johns hopkins university as a professor uh, the second work with the cancer which i did it in uh, uh, in university of minnesota right now dr jayan panyam is a uh, uh, dean in temple university and the uh, tuberculosis work this is a first graduate student dr shushita akimani right now she is a research associate in the same uh, uh, department so uh, this is the tuberculosis is uh, all it is uh, my idea and then some of the work uh, uh, like a folate folate acid on the surface this is done by uh, 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 mr shri prasad acharya he is also doing phd uh, with me he is a assistant professor in chemical engineering department uh, uh, the the targeting uh, though i have not shown we are trying to target the cancer cells not much of a good data used uh, one of my phd student is working on that and uh, uh, one of uh, uh, joyce pinto is my mtech student uh, who worked on a linear uh, pg with conjugating with the uh, with the drug and see the effect and i also collaborate with dr santosh gaonkar of department of chemistry for uh, you know chemist chemistry part of it say if i get an idea whether this chemistry works or not so that's what uh, like a benzaldehyde conjugating with the isoniazid he came up with that so uh, uh, the, the same with we have also conjugated with, with so many other things and uh, 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 dr bharat has done a bioinformatics works of that and recently we published that which one is more efficient and which one is less efficient we came up with certain things and recently published and uh, dr bharat did the bioinformatics part why that is a more efficient uh, that part and uh, dr vishnu prasad is a doctor, uh, department of microbiology in our kasturba uh, medical college uh, he uh, because uh, similar to patients uh, uh, patients uh, how they treat the patient similar way we wanted to analyze so he is the one who is authority in that and dr indira bairi she is also microbiologist in uh, manipal uh, malika manipal medical college in manipal so i collaborate with all of these people and i also collaborate with uh, uh, dr gohan jay raman uh, though uh, none of the uh, i have not included any of the slides here whatever our collaboration is and also collaborate with the ophthalmology department of the kmc uh, uh, to uh you know further whatever i found out with the dendrimer can we do it with the 
different drug and uh, more appropriate for indian condition that's what which we are looking at thank you and i am very happy to take your questions hope you enjoyed uh, my talk and uh, some thing what whatever which you have learned from here they take a yeah hello 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 hope i have not put all of you to sleep yeah yeah no 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 sir it was really yeah, yeah. can't watch say yeah one hour 10 minutes yeah i'm sorry yeah. about 5 to 10 minutes of it yeah. no no sir not a problem yeah um thank you very much for your very insightful uh, uh talk sir and uh, this is the time to take a questions and i have good number of questions from audience and i would like to pick a best of the best questions and uh, prior to that i would like to uh take a questions from panel members if there are any and uh, if there are any questions from the panel members i request you to ask the question uh bharat ji yes i think it was very refreshing to hear to a uh, chemist <laughs> uh, among these because all this time we have been uh, listening to only biologists oh and okay <laughs> fantastic uh, presentation and uh, a field of work where we are also interested and we are uh, doing some work oh. so i'm sure dr lata will be excited to uh, ask you questions because she works uh, with chemistry of uh, medicinal chemistry of natural uh, uh, compounds and dr shiban who is uh, very keen on uh, tuberculosis over oh, to you okay. dr shiban um it was doctor doctor it was fascinating to listen to you uh, it's all fundamental work and hopefully you will find applications to tuberculosis yeah. fast quick that yeah. <laughs> that's what which we are time we patented it and then you know we wanted to take it further but uh, you know it is very difficult uh, uh, especially animal model we have to take it to animal model but yeah. the animal model the main problem is you know bio safety level uh we do not have in uh, manipal and i think only two uh, places in india we have and that's where it has stopped and we want to take it at least to the uh, macrophage level infect with that and modify what all cytokines it produces why the gene changes takes place i mean lot of things can be done yeah are, are you aware of any work being done in the tb institutes of india regarding this or anything new that's coming up uh uh right now i do not know actually this is a whatever it is a, a two years old uh 2018 afterwards oh, okay. we wanted to complete uh, continue with the macrophage uh, infection and all but uh, uh, you know nobody was ready to take it because uh, uh though uh, we can have a uh, non virulent strain but when it becomes virulent we really do not know and i am a chemical engineer so i wanted a microbiologist to take care of this and uh, for that the microbiologist the biologist we said we will grow the macrophage and give it to you you do the infection and then we will give the new formulation you check it but the problem is that even they are also not interested because you know that is the animal cell line and then they contamination there should be a separate place for it and then you know for that extra money is required a lot of uh, these things so in the process we were not able to take it to the next level i really want to take this to the next level and then uh, right now as as you had asked uh, one group in pga chandigarh has done uh, the work a lot of work i think the professor has retired uh, he was in biochemistry I think Kullur, Professor Kullur, uh, of PGI Chandigarh, uh, they have done a good amount of work in that, and then afterwards, uh, nobody is taking up to the next level. Yeah. And uh, uh, recently, I saw one of the papers from the PGI Chandigarh only, because uh, tuberculosis, uh, eye tuberculosis is a you know I have never heard of it. Eye tuberculosis is a deadly, it seems. because they really do not know how it has spread to the eye and then exactly where it is a retinal pigment epithelial cells what i said that uh, the first uh, model that's where it gets intracellularly it survives there it seems and then you know like a tuberculosis means orally people take 
and the amount of drug reaching there is very small and if somebody makes a an animal model i will be very happy to inject into vitreous chamber and then you know we can uh, if people come to know this is a eye tuberculosis we can easily cure uh, with whatever technology or whatever we have developed uh, that is a one of the papers which i see not with the nanoparticle if it is gets into that what all changes it happens like a cytokine if it is a tuberculosis in is infected uh, that work is done in the pgh chandigarh uh, i saw that recently uh, other than that i think uh, uh, people are trying to make a vaccine and i feel it's a very difficult because it is a, it is not like a, our macrophages will not identify they identify it but uh, you know they will not be able to kill that so once it gets into that whatever is that ball can we deliver drug to the ball say by inhaler if you create a inhaler with a nanoparticle we inhale the nanoparticle and it goes and goes to exactly to that place and uh, uh, you know to the granuloma and then gets in there and releases drug slowly and we can kill that without spreading to the other part that will be the great thing to happen my understanding what whatever uh, about this yeah the, the frustrating those of us who work who work with tuberculosis not a single new drug has come in decades the yes. drug you yes. mentioned yes. Correct. It's a 1960 rifampicin and isoniazid. Both of them are 1960s. Pirazinamide also is an old drug. You know, you can see yes, yes. outside Correct. every hospital. See uh, dead grass. When you see, that means the people have sprayed pirazinamide there. Tuberculosis yes. people yes. took it, free pirazinamide, yes. and just threw it out. It's Correct. kind of sad that we haven't got a single drug in decades for this. And it, yes, and that was my only question. I thought you'll give me some exciting news that a new drug is coming, but I think we've got to wait. And oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I I'm not in a medicinal chemistry, so uh, I'm sorry about it. I do not know much about it because uh, my is a drug delivery. I work on drug delivery, so that's why uh, whether to how to stabilize the drug with the existing drug. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that's exactly what with azithromycin, say rifampicin, and isoniazid. Yeah. If you take it, they they take it together. In fact, yes. they react. Uh, they, as it uh, say, rifampicin has got CHO molecule and uh, isoniazid has got NH2. At certain condition, these two at at acidic condition, these two reacts and form you know uh, uh, one more compound, which we showed and not yet published actually. And then in the process, what happens is the amount of drug required. Finally, what you want is a therapeutic amount. and say isoniazid is a neurotoxic actually it is not so good if it goes to the brain it is a highly toxic mm. some of the things and then you know it's a highly water soluble luckily it will not cross cross through blood brain barrier very easily because it's highly water soluble you cannot take isoniazid for a very long time and uh, in the process uh, you know how to stop uh, the drug uh, say it the, what i understand with the basic thing is uh, tuberculosis the problem is the cell wall of the mycobacterium tuberculosis because once it gets into the endosomes with the enzymes and with that ph it survives that's why the macrophage gets you know troubled and then suddenly it calls the other cells and then it gets into the lysosomes and most of the bacteria will be lysed but here it survives Uh, so it should be some drug which should come say three of the drug it is related to cell wall only and only rifampicin is a any like any antibiotic which is used to uh, go and binds to rn uh, to stop the rna polymerase uh, uh, you know to make the rna so otherwise uh, three drugs are good more than other than the more drug how to make it more effective that is a very important thing and then see now the xrd uh, you must be knowing uh, the extremely drug resistant uh, tuberculosis is also prevalent in india and uh, uh, there is no way to treat i think in uh, four or five years back a 12 standard cbse topper died of a tuberculosis 
in bombay uh then you know he was died because of a extremely drug resistance he was infected with you know it's a what i understood is uh, most of the paper which comes from europe or this we do not do fundamental research basically we are more interested in producing paper so that's what which i see most of the people are more interested in say producing more paper rather than taking it to the next level so right. the, probably incentives are there to producing more they, they have to change the how the incentive say i do not know i am a uh, i am in a academic institute for teaching and also to train the people at uh, the research institute exactly research institutes uh, which are there like a csir research institutes their their main goal is not to produce paper so people should not uh, uh, give the promotion get the promotion because you producing more paper <laughs> solving the problem or producing new things uh, which should be based on that i see like everywhere people produce more paper rather than taking it to next level right thank you thank you very much and i'm done bharat ji dr damle i'm done so anybody else wants to button i'll i'll mute myself now thank you hello sir it was a wonderful session and uh, uh, you have elaborated different mechanisms of your experimentations uh, i have a doubt regarding one of uh, my uh, one of my uh, i one studies indicated in ayurveda basma kasi sa basma there is a, a presence of spion super para magnetic ion oxide nanoparticles okay yeah very so, good ha uh, in the raw material we are using the iron only and after processing in the final product we identified spions mm-hmm. so what is the relevance of spions i i am keen to know i keen to hear you about the uh, the uh presence of these spions what are its merits and demerits a lot of paper yes yes uh, i got your question a lot of paper in cancer has come in this actually what happens is a uh, uh, one or two paper whatever right i have not worked in it say this uh, if you are uh, 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 nanoparticle uh, outside uh, you are through magnetic things if you are in the blood if you are pushing towards the tumor it gets into the tumor and the other part of it is it holds the heat for a long time okay. in the process is if it is at uh, 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 because our body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade okay. uh, and then you know if it stays there and it gets heated up and it it will reach to 41 or 42 degrees centigrade up to so okay. in that heat actually what happens the cells will not survive it's going to kill it's going to kill because of that okay okay so that's the uh, one of the things what i have read with the cancer uh, uh, thing it must sir, be true it sir, must sir. be true with the uh, you know uh, infection also okay, right? okay. In the infection it will be true you can look into the things you know our body response is like that when we when we get a infection first thing the body response is the fever to okay. reduce the infection and uh, increase the blood flow yeah, yeah so then in the process what happens if you put this uh, the temperature of a uh, this nanoparticle if it gets into the if you know it binds to the uh, uh, you know infection infectious something and then you know the temperature is high because it yeah. holds more heat compared to the the particle so it produces hypotherm hypothermia you yeah. yes yes okay uh, fine 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 so uh, it makes sense what i said okay so, fine very fine yeah yeah thank you thank you for your yeah. clarification yeah. thank you can i come in sir uh, yes madam yeah, yeah. Uh, yes bharat ji uh, that was really a very fascinating uh, session thank you very much for that my interest uh, being in the i mean uh, drug development and uh, formulation development is whether we can uh, improve the epidermal absorption of uh, the topicals one thing and in while doing that is it necessary because in your session i saw you had to make an ester of uh, steroid to mm. for the you know to attach to the dendrimer so mm-hmm. is it necessary for us to 
you know, change the formulation accordingly or you need to customize according to our formulation, the dendrima? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, madam. So one of the thing what it is is uh, because uh, 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 we I do not study uh, how the drug is uh, you know go and bind and which part of the drug is more effective. How exactly it inhibits the activation of macrophages. So uh, we know that steroids which are go and uh, go to the uh, macrophages, it inhibits. That means it uh, the cytokine release will be stopped. That's what exactly happens. We take the steroids and then the swelling is going to reduce. Okay, the Swelling is because of the uh, release of cytokines by these macrophages. Now, what we what we want to do is, is uh, how it happens is, uh, you know, that is uh, not my thing. It's probably Dr. Bharat... Uh, if it is some people with the bioinformatics, it goes and binds exactly in that particular place and does this. What we want is we make a pro-drug. Say if we conjugate with the dendrimer and finally it should release to become a drug. That is our main goal. So if that is the case, suppose I make a amide bond. So amide bonds are a uh, very stable bond. And it is not, uh, you know, cleavable in in the actually uh, inside the cell. Probably it will with uh, with the peptidase enzymes, uh, with, because it's a peptide bond in the in our stomach it will be cleavable. So somewhere in the eye maybe that enzymes may not be there to cleave. So that's why if you put in a water itself, if it is that enzymes are not there at that place in the water itself, it will breaks open then, you know, it becomes a pro-drug will become drug. That's why which we made a, which is a cleavable or not. So whatever I showed the release, which is which is shown in the HPLC exactly uh, how it releases the drug. Uh, that's why say some of the easily breakable uh, bonds, uh, which we will have to make. Okay. In, so in case... Say, I understand. Okay. Now, uh, that was regarding steroid. Now, in case our product, we know the uh, molecule, say it is some kind of uh, small molecule. Okay. What I want to know is, you have developed a dendrimer. So, is it going to be useful to be attached to any of these or do we? Do you have to every time make a new di uh, dendrimer? Like, can I Not just necessary. buy No, no, no. You can directly buy the dendrimer. The dendrimers are available, uh, polyamidoamine dendrimers. In India, it is not available, actually. So the making dendrimer is not so easy. I did not make, actually, one of our, our lab. It has made, and then uh, afterwards, characterization and other things, which I uh, which I did, conjugating with the drug, making the pro-drug and uh, formulation, all those things, which I did. Actually, that making the dendrimer is a, a skillful thing. Uh, is polyamidoamine dendrimer is a very well-known this. Okay, and then see the when anything which is on the surface, you have to make the, if you are making a conjugation or a co making a covalent bond. There are three bonds basically in organic chemistry, which are polar, which can make a uh, covalent bond, which is yeah. a OH group with is NH two group or its COOH group. Yeah. So on the surface of that, these three uh, groups are present. That is available. Polyamidoamine dendrimer with a COOH group outside, it is available in the market. It's not in India, it is not available, but in US it is available. Okay. And in OH group on the surface, uh, it is available. In NH2 group on the surface, which is available. So since Sorry. OH is a neutral, the OH will not become O minus and H plus. Because, you know, it's a, mm. uh, it will. COOH, there is a but chance. it makes it, it more polar. Uh, yes, it makes it more polar. Correct. More polar. More polar. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can actually choose either OH or NH2 like that. What you mean? Yes. Right? Either okay. OH, NH2, or COOH also. Correct. Acid groups. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was uh, one thing, and also I happened to read one um, um, article about uh, polysaccharide. Uh, nanoparticles, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, they have used the natural uh, um, yeah. 
biomolecule like of epigalactocatechin gallate, which is loaded with the polysaccharide nanoparticles. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, so most of our, you know, uh, these are very commonly found in um, Ayurvedic uh, plants, actually, mm -hmm. catechins. And so whether we can use uh, the same to improve the drug delivery of uh, Ayurvedic medicines. This is just a thought that's it. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. See, the thing is, uh, your area is good, madam, because the, now the what what I understood is uh, nobody has evaluated how the Ayurvedic uh, formulations work. Uh, probably if we evaluate and make it, a, uh, I mean, that's why the Ayush is giving a lot of importance for that. What you exactly said, it is, uh, it is uh, correct. But only thing is, why I have used the hydrophobic is we want to encapsulate more amount of drug. We know the drug, that's why. And then with the polymer, which I use the hydrophobic polymer because it's also FDA approved, which I use. As you said, a lot of other polymers which can be used, which are water soluble also, and some of them water insoluble. If it is water soluble, then you have to make a hydrogel because you have to make it a water insoluble. Finally, you want to make it a suspension of a particles. Yes, which, which releases slowly. Right. right. So uh, then you have to make it, then chemistry comes into picture. Uh, yes, you have to make, make a, a gel, gel like, yes, call it yes. cross linking. Can we make a cross linking? Yes. And then it really, it, uh, it allows the water inside, then it swells up, and then the, and the drug will move out from there and slowly. And then it also gives a little bit of a stability, uh, all, all those things. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Love, thank love you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, That's you it from me. Thank you, sir. Good questions. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, yes. um, are there um, antimicrobial peptides, AMPs, or uh, you know, um, uh, you know, these uh, nanoparticles, which, uh, without binding to the mole active molecule, uh, increase the skin penetration? Uh, yeah, yeah. I do not know, sir. Yes, I have, I, I have, I have seen. Yes, 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 sir. But okay. uh, 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 yes, uh, but uh, you know, it's not my research area. Correct. Uh -huh. People are working in it. How to uh, Im improve the skin penetration? Uh, but uh, you have to think of one of the things. Uh, approval from FDA. That is a see. I I made this dendrimer. Or, or, or rather, we in our group, and then we uh, showed all the things. Uh, and then, you know, approval of FDA is a, a very important thing. Why? When you put into the eye, then finally it releases drug. How it, what is the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of this polymer? Finally, how it metabolizes in the body, that is a very important thing. Okay, how it gets out. And yeah, I, mean, say, I, I, I understand that. I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, loudly about topicals, not on the, you know, uh, orals. Uh, let's say arginine-rich uh, peptides uh -huh. and uh, using them, but without they binding to the uh, effective moiety for the, for, the, for the simple reason that there could be multiple uh, pharmacologically effective molecules in one compound. Uh -huh. So uh, leading only one, driving one into... Uh, keratinocyte may not be uh, why so are there something uh, is there a concept of uh, increasing the skin penetration yes non, there are non many yeah. Yeah, yes 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 i think it's certain frequency if you put on the screen it can be increased people are working i think one of the important person is uh, i think indian in us he is now in howard uh, dr samir mitragotri uh, because you put on that, it uh, uh, they are trying to deliver insulin through that, you know, uh, because, you know, if you, it increase, penetration is going to increase. Again, uh, what I mean to say is, if it penetration is going to increase, skin is the one of the, uh, you know, uh, outer layer and then very important outer layer of, our, uh, uh, of, of the body. If the penetration, how many, how much time the penetration is going to increase? That is the important part. <laughs> the penetration increases for a long time, then in, uh, with that, some other pathogen will get in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I understand that, and I think that, that is the thing. A lot of yeah. lot of work is going on in that. I, actually, I, I think also Dr. Harish uh, Parekh, uh, who is in uh, 
uh, whom I met in Australia, I was also working mm-hmm. with, in New York uh, with your uh, organization. They are, uh, they are, uh, look, I mean, they have demonstrated uh, that through nose, uh, you can uh, uh, get into uh, direct uh, blood, brain, through blood brain barrier into the brain. Ah, yes, 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 correct. Uh, through nose, it uh, directly gets into the blood brain barrier. Yes. Mm-hmm. is one of that. And, um, but uh, I mean, in conversation with him, he was telling that it is possible for us to make it uh, get into keratinocyte, but not get into the bloodstream. Probably, mm-hmm. we'll get him as a speaker one of these days. Uh, you know, I was just yeah. thinking when I heard your speech, I think we should get him as well. Yes, thank, yes, thank yes, you very much. Now, now. Yeah, thank you very much. I will, uh, uh, I mean, let uh, uh, others talk now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks for the questions from panel. And I would like to take uh, uh, questions from audience. So I have a question uh, from audience. The first question is, uh, if there are any possibilities of uh, triggering any an allergic response in retina uh, to the dimer, in the sense, uh, is there any allergic reaction for the dendrimer in uh, retina? No, uh, it is not there. Uh, that is checked actually. So it, it is not, it's a highly biocompatible. There is no trigger of response, immune response. So uh, 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 anything, any, any, anything, uh, you know, uh, anything gets into the uh, 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 retina, it will create a response. Actually, it's not because in it's a central nerve connected to central nervous system. Uh, uh, you know, you a small uh, any anything will create a little bit of a response. But you know you have conjugated with the a drug which is going to inhibit that. Okay, but it is not a, the that it will not create a big uh, immunological response at all. It's a biocompatible. Thank you, sir. And I have an next question uh, from uh, Kantesh. Uh, his question is: In view of nano medicine, what is your perspective on Ayurveda or Siddha herbo mineral combinations? I have not worked in this, but you know, it is a very good uh, area uh, as far as I know uh, for this, whatever uh, this, uh, because you know, a lot of the already formulations are there. It is also working, but uh, how it works, we really uh, do not know. That's what which I uh, understood, is especially some of the Siddha medicines. One of my colleagues will uh, show uh, he worked on the nanoparticles were there in that, but how it works exactly, uh, people are not f- understood. But yeah, as now Ayush is giving a lot of importance for making it like how the Western medicine uh, develops, like a cell line, cell line to animal model, animal model to, uh, you know, finally to the phase one, phase two, phase three trial. Uh, you know, but uh, Ayurveda do not believe in this. That's what which I was uh, talking with one of the Ayurveda persons. Uh, and he he says, uh, you know, human beings are different from the animals. Uh, it may work or it may not work. That is true, but that's how the Western medicine are uh, developed. And, you know, some of the things are really fascinating. See, the lead is used. Even I have taken uh, lead is used in uh, in the formulation, uh, lead nanoparticle, which is used in the formulation of Ayurveda, and mercury is used in the formulation of Ayurveda. But uh, it's a non toxic. And then when you analyze it, the mercury is there, and then you know, uh, mercury is neurotoxic. That's what they say. The small amount of mercury is also causes a lot of problem. That's what. But in the formulation, I think one of the papers which I uh, did, I think one. Dr. Uh, Bellare of IIT Bombay has uh, done a lot of work in Ayurvedic formulations. Uh, the you know mercury why it is is it's it's a uh, density is very high 13.6 uh, uh, compared to uh, water, but when the formulated uh, mercury when you put that it will not settle down. How they have formulated that, what the mercury, what they have modified the mercury, 
that there is a process of modifying the mercury all these things people have done it in thousands of years back and it is so fascinating now we are trying to understand how they have done it and if you say the same thing to the western people they do not believe in it so it's a fascinating field actually of understanding ayurveda and lot of lot of scope according to me yes yeah. thank you sir thank you. Uh, i think thank the question is very well answered and i have a next question uh, like uh, in your opinion what are the challenges in the field of nano medicine especially from a synthetic point of view uh getting the i say getting the consistently say i i i might be doing the same thing but the scaling up is the problem scaling up is the major problem in uh, in a nano medicine in the sense say suppose i make it 30 my, mg or 100 mg of a formulation and then you want to scale up to 10 grams or say 1 kg then say nanoparticle what is the range of nanoparticles you are producing and the next thing is say i i told this is a uh formulation how this formulation is it's a suspension right suspension in a in a liquid we have to give and the sterile liquid and nanoparticle exactly and it should be in a suspended form and then you know educate the people how to administer nanoparticle so because you know most of the people are compounders or the people who take ordinary people every time you cannot go to the doctor to take the drug so administering the drug so that's why whatever i have shown is the cancer and then i uh, at least you could go every two months or three months and then nanoparticles are injected in this the challenge is getting a consistency batch to batch consistency that is a very uh, challenging task um getting the exact consistency of the particle size and then other things that's why i think uh, it's a i nanoparticle though lot of research is going on none of the products are there uh, i do not know why uh, none of the products are there yeah. because once it gets into the this uh, then uh, standardization exactly when you scale up say 1 kg i am producing today in this batch the nanoparticle of size is 200 to 250 the range it should be so producing that in the scale up is the problem you cannot make it a 30 mg or 50 mg at a time and create then the cost will be so high so we are doing it in the lab for the experimentation and for the research so there should be proper with exactly this nanoparticle size should be produced like that that is the problem which i am feeling and then administering that with the common people that's why the oral medicines are very useful because anybody can take the medicine hello yeah, make make sense what i what i spoke sure sir <laughs> yeah uh, my next question is uh, cancer stem cells have drug resistance property can nanoparticles overcome this problem yes uh, the next thing is that's what which i showed in one of the slides it is taken up with a different mechanism probably it is overtaken if the further work should be done but some of the work has already been done uh, some of the uh, nanoparticle uh, the Uh, cancer stem cells over expresses certain receptors you just uh, uh, you know make a ligand to that over expressing uh, receptors and then it is taken up by the receptor mediated endocytosis then the chances of killing cancer cells is high that's what uh, some of the results have shown and actually one of the uh, blood cancer the cure is there what they have made is an antibody which goes and exactly binds because it's a blood uh, exactly goes and binds to the cancer antibody that and then the it releases there and the killing takes place so a lot of research is there but no product yet the product is not there one except the 
ब्लड कैंसर मेक सेंस व्हाट आई व्हाट आई स्पोक वेरी मच वेरी मच हेलो या सर Yeah. Thank you very much for a detailed answer. And through this, we got to know like uh, the real challenge in an NMS medicine is associated with uh, scale up and productization, and that is where exactly really uh, we all have to look into. And I would like to pass on to uh, Dr. Damle, sir. Uh, yeah, I had just typed a question there. Uh, are other questions over, Bharat? Are there any questions from uh, outsiders? Yes, sir. I I will. I would like to take another question. Yeah, yeah. Finish, sir, finish that. Finish that. I will ask my question in the last. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, can you talk a bit on gold and uh, silver in nano medicine? Oh, Because I'm sorry. I'm not aware. Ah, uh, yes. Uh huh. Because in Ayurveda, you might have heard of Swarna Prashna and all. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, as we have uh, majority of Ayurvedic uh, audience, uh, it will be really insightful if you talk on this. Oh, uh, uh, actually, then all of you must be knowing much better than me because I have not worked in this area. I'm sorry, I do not want to speak uh, uh, in, in shallow way. Uh, yes, uh, you know, as you both uh, silver and uh, uh, both are. Uh, bio compatible and then you know in the body it at uh, ayurveda a lot of uh, uh, formulations are used uh, uh, with this but uh, i have not worked in this uh, except in you know they make a uh, sulfur bond with the gold nano particle and then they have done lot of a uh, which uh, uh, i have not done it and then lot of people have worked on uh, see where it is going nanoparticle because uh, uh, one of the important thing is as i said uh, the gold nanoparticle uh, the 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 amount uh, the uh, what i say the particle size can be uh, actually can be maintained a 50 nanometer means a 50 nanometer gold nanoparticle can be made exactly uh, like uh, that's why it will be uh, much useful Uh, so, but not with the whatever we make in a bio materials. Uh, only the, the, the tracking that where it is going and our people have done lot of work on this, but uh, I have not done any work and I do not know much about it. I'm sorry about it. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, um, one of the things which is coming forward is like. Uh, Uh, people of uh, uh, who have studied science and uh, uh, traditional uh, medicine, maybe or medicine, yes, yeah, are coming together. Uh, secondly, non-anglicized uh, uh, heart is very important for us to be together. And, yeah, uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I can see that with the multiple talks that we had here, people are open for collaboration, and uh, I think it's very important. All the Uh, everybody to realize this, including um, uh, AMAI. Uh, any of your students, your people, uh, uh, PhD graduates want to collaborate. Um, you know, uh, uh, people like Rajguru are open for uh, collaboration and uh, probably. Oh, I will be very happy, sir. Actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I believe more in Ayurvedic medicine. I mean, I cannot say like for infectious disease to take, but all the other things, especially chronic. Uh, diseases uh ayurveda works perfect actually so uh, i believe in that and then only thing is the validation and uh, somehow we have to identify how to validate each of this i meet regularly you must be knowing dr veliyathan he is in manipal he has written a book and i think he is now in charge of a uh, uh, dbt ayurveda uh, A program. Uh, so he is also, though he was our previous vice chancellor. Uh, after his retirement, he got fascinated with Ayurveda and written a book in, I um, mean, modified the Charaka Samhita into English, and then uh, he understands lot of uh, Ayurveda and so many things. Say 
each individuals are same we cannot give now you just look at the personalized medicine is coming how it is coming say we uh, look at the how long time back thousands of years back people have identified individuals are not same each human being is not same it depends on vata pitta and kapha somebody is you know it's na you know vata person pitta person and this now you just look at that for the cancer they are doing the same thing now the personalized medicine is coming so the, that's what some of the diseases with the chronic diseases especially they give the everybody they treat the same and give the same dose it creates a lot of havoc uh, in the society then the western medicine has not understood anything about the body uh, actually other than they have understood in the one dimensional way but ayurveda understanding is much different way actually it gives a new newer dimension of understanding so i think i was talking with the dr veliathan in one of the drugs which is used for arthritis like uh, which is a deadly drug and then uh, you know uh, it's a once in a week you take it changes lot of things its side effects are so high they administer for everybody then he started uh, doing the some of the things it is more effective in few of the people where the i mean because vata or pitta with some of them with the certain constitution of the body this drug is more effective compared to the other people this is what the identified uh, he was talking about the, this new dimension indian uh, you know i feel uh, the western medicine forget about the western medicine that the icmr should identify these things and then should also teach them whatever the mbbs doctors uh some aspect of indian medicine in the process they can understand uh, properly say now i will tell you a simple example uh the food what we eat uh, in western medicine they do not care they think about only protein uh carbohydrate and other things say if you go for a with a fever i asked a one of the person uh with the md can i take this food uh yeah yeah you can take any food i mean when i was suffering for something can i have pizza i asked him yeah yeah you can take pizza also i mean any food they assume a somebody with a md who is going to become a doctor uh he cannot understand exactly we from past thousands and thousands of 500 years we have understood what food is so important before people used to identify this food you do not take nowadays people have left even that also because there is a wide gap between uh, western medicine allopathy people who uh, you know administer allopathy and then the people who look into ayurveda but ayurveda says what you eat is medicine the what your food you eat is you eat like a medicine the food is very important part of your uh, you know day to day activity that is a i mean people have look into the health uh instead of aping western civilization we will have to look into what we have in our tradition and adopt i feel that will be a, a greater uh, thing i do not know sure, sure. from my uh, sure, sure. i have told <laughs> i think we, we should collaborate because uh, truth may be somewhere in between uh, uh, yes sir everybody i agree i find what is in my heart i spoke true. actually i do not know yeah, yeah no, i agree. <laughs> totally agree and uh, endorse what you have said uh, yeah. truth could be somewhere in medis- uh, in between because uh, traditions speak a lot of things and uh, some of the contradictory things and yes, science also correct. sometimes speaks uh, contradictory things yes so uh, anyway uh, it is uh, very uh, nice to hear that people are willing to coordinate uh, collaborate and uh, ho- hopefully we'll uh, uh, do some work together uh, one day yes uh, i will i will love to love to love sure. to work sure and uh, also with the our uh, friends in kerala because they they are yes. really <laughs> yeah, filled yeah. with enthusiasm and lot of resources now yes. i request dr shiban ganju to deliver word of thanks um, on behalf of uh, Atrimed uh, Pharma and uh, all the members of the panel, I thank the speaker and all the participants who are far away from us. It was a wonderful session. 
hopefully we'll have more contact with you and more sessions within the future so we can understand your and others work much more than what we know now now to the initiation good initiation to nano medicine and hopefully next time you will deliver more fascinating story to us thank you everybody and we'll see you in the next lecture keep uh, keep on the lookout for our information for the next hour with the renowned scientist and uh, with that we'll call it a day since nobody has got any questions we come to close now thank you thank very you. much good thank night. you very much sir good night thank you thank you for giving me an opportunity i had i had a wonderful time thank you very much thank you thank you very much thanks everyone Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Bharat. Thank you. I had a wonderful time. So we'll be in touch. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much.